Uh, hello all. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's online seminar hosted by the International Inequality Institute at London School of Economics. My name is Paolo Brunori and I'm Assistant Professor Arial Research Fellow at LSE International Inequality Institute and I'm very pleased uh, to be chairing today's seminar titled The Impact of COVID-19 on Global Inequality and Poverty which is uh, part of the III uh, Inequality Seminar series. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Dr. Nishan Yonsan, and I am happy to see that despite being quite early in DC, uh, both co-authors of the paper, Christoph Lankner and Daniel Male, join us for, uh, for the seminar. Uh, Jonsson works uh, at the Poverty and Inequality Team in the Development Data Group uh, at the World Bank, uh, and he contributes to uh, the group's global agenda on measuring poverty and inequality. His research focuses on the cause, consequences, uh, and measurement of poverty and inequality. Uh, as a, this is uh, a Zoom meeting, uh, it's not a, a, a webinar uh, in the classical format of a webinar, uh, is a little less passive, so uh, we can see our audience uh, and uh, the audience can interact uh, with the speakers. So uh, I would like to ask you if you can please keep yourself muted, but maybe if you can, uh, you can you can keep uh, um, on the videos if it's possible. Uh, of course, there will be uh, occasion for, for you to, to ask questions to the speakers uh, after the presentation and I, I ask you to do it uh, or raising your hand. Uh, I will check this, but I also will check uh, the chat so you can paste your question directly in the chat and, uh, and I will read it. But uh, in both cases, please, uh, before, uh, before you ask a question, state your name and affiliation. Uh, I also would like to mention uh, the next uh, upcoming event, uh, the III. Um, which is another uh, inequality seminar uh, titled Global Wealth, Gender and Carbon Injustice, New Findings from the World Inequality Report 2022. Uh, and this seminar will take place at the same time next uh, Tuesday, 1st of February. Uh, the link to this event and more upcoming events can be found uh, in the chat. And I will now... <coughs> Uh, leave the floor to Dr. Johnson, and many thanks uh, to all for uh, joining the event. Thank you so much, Paolo, for the for the kind introduction. Um, I don't know if you can see my slides there. Let me put it on full screen. Yep. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks everyone for being here, and and special thanks to to the organizers for putting this together and inviting us. Um, I'm just trying to get my Zoom screen as small as uh, the, the, the screen as small as possible so that I don't doesn't block my slide here. Okay. Um, um, so thank you very much for, for inviting us. Um, Christoph Lachner was, was there if you if you look for him with a baby probably, and Daniel Mahler and myself. We've been thinking about this and, and working on this uh, for about two years now. And and um, you know it's 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 a pleasure to be here to, to share some of our thinking uh, behind the topic and then also some of where that thinking has led us to. Uh, I just want to also say that uh, while we are all the authors affiliated with the World Bank, uh, the opinions expressed here today will be our own and not that um, of the bank. Um, what I'm going to do uh, before we start is um, I'm going to take a step back and, and I urge you to do the same. And think about the topic itself, like global inequality, global, global poverty. And I see that I was just browsing the, the, the people here and, and the names there um, while Paulo was speaking. Um, there are quite a few people who, who, who are here today that have thought on this and, and worked on this much more than, much longer than, than I have. Um, but, but I don't think anyone will disagree when I say that um, it is a, it's a pretty difficult topic, a challenging topic, just a number of things that you, one has to um, to think about. 
um, at least I have found it very challenging. And then, and also the the the, the introduction of COVID and 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 having that at the background or or the foreground doesn't make it less challenging. Um, our approach always has been uh, for this study to to sort of best utilize the, the resources that we have, the data and, and et cetera. Um, and hopefully today, you know, some of our assumptions and, and methodological, cho methodological choices uh, will reflect that. Um, of course, one big reason for us to be here is, is, uh, is a little bit selfish which in, in the sense that we, we are here to solicit as much feedback as possible. Uh, so do feel free to, to you know, jump in and, and, and share comments and thoughts and anything that would, could improve our, our thinking at that, at that sense. Okay, so why do we want to, um, why do we want to think about a difficult topic? Well, we know that COVID started and still is a, a predominantly a health crisis, but then it has had tremendous economic impact, negative impact. And the negative impact turns out has been very disparate across regions, across geographies and across households. What we want to do is we want to identify sort of the, the, the more severe, uh, severe effects, economic effects. Um, and, and in doing that, hopefully that, that will help policymakers and, and others to, to sort of design their policy and uh, et cetera for recovery, okay? Um, in doing so, what we will do is we will uh, go back to the literature on global poverty and global inequality and, and, and use their assumptions and methods wholesale. Um, there's, a, there's a deep literature spanning probably three decades or more, some of which we have listed here and, and there are a lot more than this. So we'll be, we'll be borrowing quite a bit from, from them. In terms of poverty during COVID, um, global poverty, we ourselves have been doing quite a bit over the last year and a half, putting out uh, certain uh, updates of, of poverty and estimates and so on and so forth. And there are others who've done the same, uh, for example, Sumner and, and his colleagues and, and others. Uh, in terms of inequality, there's been quite a few paper um, at the country level and, and, and a few paper that, papers that have looked at various country groupings. At the, at the global level, there hasn't been one that's, that's meaningful. You know, what I mean by that, obviously, there are a few papers that I've listed or, or reports that I've listed here, and the Deaton paper jumps out. But what Deaton did was he looked at the cross-country differences using per capita GDP. So, so there he ignored the, the within-country differences, right? And we have done something similar, not accounting for the within-country differences before as well, using, using household surveys and, and income and consumption from those surveys. What we'll try and do today is, is um, try and not only account for these cross-country differences, but also within country differences and try and get to a, uh, uh, an estimate of, of interpersonal inequality. We'll try and figure out the welfare uh, of people in that, that sense, okay? And, and the concept for, for uh, global inequality is, is Branko has termed it concept three. That's what we're looking at today. To do this, what we'll require is obviously a starting point, which will be our 2019 distribution. What we will do is we'll try and, and, and uh, derive a distribution for all countries for 2019. And then we'll grow that 2019 distribution forward to 2020. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll have the, the quote unquote actual COVID influence distribution, but we'll also, have, uh, we'll also create a distribution that's a counterfactual and, and the reason for doing this uh, counterfactual 2020 distribution um, is because there are changes that have happened from 2019 to 2020, which perhaps would have happened without COVID happening. And what we want to do is we want to net out those changes and, and using counterfactual, we try and, and net out the changes to get the net effect of COVID, okay? And that's, that's sort of the, the plan today. Um, so let's start with the 2019 distributions. And we have a few countries. Uh, we have many countries with, with distributions, uh, household surveys for 2019. We'll use those, obviously. Uh, but there are also a lot, many countries that do not have household surveys in 2019. So for those surveys, uh, what we will do is, for instance, in, in this example here, we have a survey that, uh, that is from 2016. What we will do is we'll take that 20, this distribution from 2016 and grow it to 2019 
depending on the growth in national accounts, can be it uh, household consumption growth or, or per capita GDP growth, depending on what the, the underlying survey uses, consumption or income aggregate. Um, and one thing we'll, we'll, we'll sort of um, assume while doing this is that the inequality within that distribution stays the same as the last household survey. So for example, for this uh, uh, distribution in 2016, the 2019 inequality level is the same as 2016 inequality level. Um, so, you know, the, doing that, um, there's obviously positives and negatives of doing that. The positives for, for us uh, for doing that is that this is exactly what the World Bank does uh, uh, in reporting global poverty numbers. And, and then what we are able to do then is when we calculate our poverty and inequality estimates in 2020, we can uh, go back you know, 30 years and, and compare that directly to, to, to the changes in the last 30 years. Okay, and, and for our case, you know, the, re the really important thing is that is the change from 2019 to 2020. So, so the, the assumption from 2016 to 2019 doesn't really affect um, us that much. Uh, we're able to do this for about 167 countries that, span, that covers about 97% of the world's population. For the 3% of, of the world's population, for those countries, we do not have um, service or we do not have service that, that, that we can meaningfully use. So for those, what we'll do is we'll take the regional averages. So by that, what I mean is, for instance, Afghanistan does not have a survey that we can use. Um, we will take the average of the other countries, the weighted average of the other countries uh, in, in South Asia to get a distribution that we use at, for Afghanistan. Okay? And, and since it is only 3% of the global population, for, for the global estimates, it does not affect um, those that much. Okay, so now we have uh, 2019 distributions for all countries. Right. What we are going to do next is try and grow that 2019 distribution to 2020. First, let's talk about the counterfactual 2020 distribution, and that is uh, fairly straightforward. We'll use the same uh, mechanics that we used for the 2019 distribution. We'll take the, the growth rates um, that we have from before the crisis, so it does not account for the crisis, and then grow the distribution from 2019 to 2020. The growth rates come from macro and poverty outlooks of the World Bank. Um, they are released every spring and, and fall. So we'll use the last one before the crisis, which is from fall of 2019. Okay. Uh, one thing to, to sort of note uh, is that um, we only have growth in, in, in GDP. So we have the growth of GDP per capita, right? Um, so it turns out that, that household consumption, the average consumption in household surveys do not grow at the same rate as per capita GDP rate, they grew slightly lower than that, though lower than per capita GDP growth rates. So to account for this, what we'll also do is, for instance, if, if a, a country grows at 1% per capita GDP, then we'll go to that the households in the country and, and say the household incomes or consumptions grow by 0.85%. By so we'll shave off a little bit of growth in that manner. Okay, and that way we have the counterfactual distributions for, for 2020. Okay. Next, what we want to do now is to, is to build our, our quote unquote actual uh, COVID influence, influence distribution for 2020. Um, it would be wonderful if we had that uh, data from, from the national statistical offices. Uh, as you can see in the map, there, there are basically seven countries that we have data for. Um, so far, okay. Um, and the data comes in the form of something like this for, for the US, where what we are trying to get to is, is an equivalent of disposable household income growth. Uh, for the US, they present it in um, a tablet form for, uh, 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 in, as growth for, for each quintile of the distribution, right? Um, and then we'll take that growth from 2019 to 2020 and go back to our 2019 distribution and grow the quintiles according to these growth rates. So we will do that for, for each of those countries. For the US, uh, just to make a note of this, uh, we, do find, we do see that um, the lower quintiles, the poorer quintiles grew much, much higher than the, than the higher quintiles or the richer quintiles. And we'll come back to this in a little bit as well. Okay, 
we have seven countries from 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 the NSOs, NSOs um, for the for the next option or the next best option that we have, and we're calling these by the way methods, and you can think of these as as data data sources. So our second best option is to go to the world's world banks, um, what we call phone surveys, but they are I think formally referred to as a high frequency monitoring surveys. Um, you can go to these phone surveys. And the phone surveys um, have some uh, were conducted over the, the the period of the crisis, and and in particular they have a question that that um, that we want to use, which is basically how much income or total income in, of the household has changed, or not how much, sorry, if your income has changed um, since the start of the pandemic. And the household responds responds by saying either they have decreased their their total income, they have increased or they have had no change in their income, okay? And we will use this information from the phone surveys. The, the, the negatives of the phone surveys is that we're not able to link the households in the phone service to our underlying 2019 distribution. And in the, in the phone service, we are not able to identify which uh, quintile of the distribution or, or what, which part of the income distribution the household belongs to. The second problem is that we also do not know what the size of those um, losses or gains were, right? So to overcome these, first of all, to, to, to sort of link the household surveys to the phone surveys or the phone surveys to, to the household surveys, what we do is we go to the phone surveys okay, and then go to a particular type of household, let's say in rural areas with certain demographic and household characteristics, and try and calculate the probability of income loss, income gain, or income or no change in their income, um, and take those probabilities, go back to the 2019 distribution, find those type of households, and apply randomly um, whether these households had an increase, decrease, or no change in in um, in income using these probabilities. Okay. For example, let's see. Let's say that the, the first table up here shows the, the, the household surveys, and there are four households. And the second, second table down, down here shows you the, the welfare distribution of that country in 2019. So what we'll do is, let's say there are four uh, households in rural areas with less than primary education, uh, and then 50% of them had a, a, a chance of decrease in, in, in income. Um, what we'll do is we'll find similar households in, in the 2019 distribution and then assign them a prob with a probability of 50% decrease or a 25% 25 increase or a 25% no change. We'll, we'll assign them whether they had an increase, decrease, or, or no change in income. Okay, and that's how we link the phone surveys to the, uh, to the 2019 distribution that we have. Uh, turns out that we can actually match, uh, we can actually, we actually know for Nigeria exactly which households uh, they, uh, the, the phone survey comes from because we can link the phone survey to an online distribution and, and we can know exactly who lost and what part of the distribution had a, a loss or, or a gain. And turns out if we use that information or our predicted uh, method, and the, the difference in probability or difference in poverty and inequality that we calculate is not that different. And we can talk about this in, in, uh, later as well. Okay, that, that solves some our first problem, right? Which is which is we now know that from our 2019 distributions, which households had an increase in income or decrease in income. Now the second problem is obviously we don't know how much that increase or decrease is, right? And and to to overcome that, what we are going to do is we're we're going to start with what we know, which is we have two areas, rural and urban urban areas, and we, within those rural and urban areas, there are three groups of households with it which is those that had an increase, those, those that had a decrease, and those that had um, no change in, in, in income, right? Um, so what we are gonna do is we're gonna add up those growth rates for each group of, of households, right? If we do that, for instance, take the growth rate of those who had an increase in income, the plus sign, multiply the, the share of income coming from that group, do the same for those who had a decrease in income, and do the same for those who had a, no change in income, we'll get to the aggregate growth rate, total growth rate of the rural areas, okay? We can do the same for the urban areas as well. 
Additionally, what we know is for those households that did not have a change in income, the growth rate is just zero. So we can just ignore that and, and drop that from our expression. So we, we have a starting point here. The second thing we also want to know is if, if I aggregate everyone in the rural areas and everyone in, in the urban areas, then that's everyone in, in, in the country, right? So if we aggregate everyone's income in, 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 or growth in the, in the country, we should get somewhere close to the national a growth in national accounts, right? Um, so we should be at least consistent with, 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 with that. So using these information, we try and back out the, the size of the, of the income growth, income growth or income changes. The problem is that the national accounts do not have uh, growth in rural areas and growth in, or do not report growth in rural areas and growth in urban areas, firstly. Secondly, uh, obviously we still don't have that who had an increase and who had a decrease in rural and urban areas, right? To overcome the first problem, we have to make an additional assumption, which is that um, we do have in, in, in the national, national uh, in the growth, um, um, in the, in the uh, national accounts, we do have growth from agriculture, industry, and services. We do have sectoral growth rates. So what we'll assume is um, growth from agriculture pertains to rural growth rate. Growth from industry comes from, to, goes to urban areas, and then growth from services is split between urban and rural areas. Okay? In particular, what we'll assume is the growth in rural areas times the share of of income coming from rural areas. We'll call this growth contribution from rural areas. So the growth contribution of, from rural areas is equivalent to the growth contribution from agriculture plus some share of growth, growth contribution from service areas, service sector, right? And same for, for urban areas, right? Um, so that's that would be our, our way to sort of assign how much there was growth in rural areas versus how much there was growth in, in urban areas. This equation one at the bottom basically rewrites this in terms of contribution, but adding that small c over there. One thing we'll also assume is that uh, PIDA could be somewhere between zero and one. The share could be could be anything between zero and one, but for, for our case here, uh, and we've used uh, population share as well, but what we'll assume today is PIDA is equivalent to the rural or urban income shares. So for example, if, if um, uh, rural areas generated 30% of the income, we're assuming that 30% of the services go to rural areas. Okay. Nishan, sorry to interrupt. Can I ask a quick question of clarification? Definitely, Jigo, go ahead. So these growth, this sectoral growth rates, you already have them for the growth rate between 19, 2019 and 2020 for most countries? Um, these are growth forecasts. Ah, these are still forecasts. That's right. Okay. They are. They are. I mean, they are realized now. They're so they're. So these are actual ones. That's right. The the um, the recent ones are are actual. Yes. Okay. All right. So it's probably a mix in there somewhere. Maybe. That's right. For twenty twenty, it, it is it is realized already. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. So. Um, so we are halfway done, right? We, we have figured out growth rates for, for the rural areas. Now, what we also want to do is sort of figure out the, the growth for those households that had an increase or growth for, for those households that had a, a, a decrease in, in, in income. So to do that, we just have to, have to assign a growth rate for one of those, right? What, what we'll do is we'll assume that for those households that had an increase in income, those increases were equivalent to the increases in what we had assumed, what we had, uh, um, um, what we had had um, forecasted before the crisis. So, for example, if if the rural areas were supposed to grow at five percent growth rate um, before the crisis, we'll we'll assign that five percent to those households that had an increase in income. Okay, that allows us then to just back out the growth rate in rural areas. Okay, I'm just rewriting equation two here in terms of growth contribution so that we can equate it to equation one. And then when we do that, we can simply back out the growth rate for rural households that had a decline in growth. So we now we have um, growth rate for rural households that had an 
that had an increase in income. We had a growth rate for rural households that had a decrease in income and, and the same process for, for the urban areas as well. So we have those growth rates as well. One problem still exists, which is that, uh, suppose there are, there are 100 households, right? In, in rural areas with a decline in income. Uh, we know that the average growth rate is this, is this G rural negative, or let's call it negative 3%. We know that the average growth rate should be negative 3% for that 100 households, but we do not know, you know if one household grew by negative 1%, the other by negative 5% or so on and so forth. What we'll assume is that everybody grew by that negative 3%. Turns out that uh, we have some, uh, some robustness to, to, to discuss later, but then turns out that, that even if we assign them different growth rates, the, the, the inequality and poverty statistics don't change that much. Okay, so that gives us uh, uh, some countries with, with uh, the NSO data, we have, we have the 2019 distribution for those countries. The phone surveys, we add 40 odd countries with, with, with the phone surveys. We still have a lot more countries uh, and, uh, and our map is still empty, okay? So what we're gonna do is we are gonna uh, rely on the literature and, and country level studies to, to get uh, some sort of statistics from, from those countries. So we we'll apply the, those where they're available. These will be something like um, the, uh, the, the tabulated data that we saw for the US. Um, where they are not available, we'll just use the sectoral growth rate split that we discussed for rural and urban areas using the, the sectoral growth rates. And then when those are also not available, we'll, we'll, we'll go to the national growth rates, the GDP per capita growth rates, and apply that to all households. There we'll assume distribution does not change uh, within the country. And then finally, we have that 3% of households that, um, that just don't have data and we'll have to use the, uh, the averages, regional averages. Okay, so just to, just to put that all together, uh, here we have two tables on top, the population coverage, and then on the bottom, the number of countries using each of those methods. So the methods are, are from the most preferred NSO data on the left to the least preferred regional average. And then for each region and, and globally, we have the share of population on the top table that comes from each of those methods. And on the bottom, we have the number of countries. Ideally, uh, of course, we would ob obviously, the best case scenario would be everyone having data from the NSOs on the first column. But ideally what we would like is most of the population to be within the first three uh, columns. Those are our more preferred options. Rural and urban does give you some level of changes in inequality with two points, two growth rates. Um, the least preferred options are, are the last two columns, which is using the national growth rates and, and regional average. And, and luckily for us, uh, there we have only 7% of, of, the, of the global population. Most of the population, 7%, 3% are, are, are in the first three um, bins. So what we discussed, the results we discussed today will be based on, 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 on this distribution. Okay? And, and we expect this to change a little bit in, in, in the next few months. Okay, so let's start with uh, discussing some of the, um, some of the findings from, from our preferred methods first, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go to looking at the global picture for poverty and, and inequality. Let's start with the data from NSOs. And let's, let's talk about US because we've already seen the data. The US is the second panel from the right. Here we're showing you the, the growth incident curve, lining everyone up from the poorest on the left to the richest on the right, and looking at their growth, uh, growth rates, right? The red line basically tells you there is no growth. Anything above that is positive growth. Anything below that is negative growth. And as we noted earlier, um, the poorer parts of the distribution in the US had an increased um, larger income, whereas, whereas the, the richer part of the distribution had a negative uh, and, and less income, right, growth. And we find this downward sloping growth incidence curve. What that tells you is, um, or what that tells us is that uh, it's a 2020 inequality was was lower in the US than 2019, okay? And if you look to the left of, of US, most countries, and I'm pushing it for Korea there a little bit, but then most countries there have that declining, some sort of declining 
um, inequality for those countries. On, on, the on the right, however, for Vietnam, we see the opposite, where the richer part of the distribution grew much faster or much greater than the lower part. And then we have that upward sloping growth resilience curve implying uh, increased inequality in 2020 compared to 2019. Okay. Uh, for the phone service, what we are going to show you is um, changes in, in poverty first and then changes in, in inequality. Here, let's start with the left panel. We've listed all the countries, and what we're measuring here is the change in, in extreme poverty grouped by the region they are they're in. And in this case, on the left panel, it is the counterfactual, which is basically where we would have expected uh, countries to be had the pandemic not happened. And you'll notice that most of the countries, the bar goes to the left, that is below zero, meaning that poverty, extreme poverty, that is those living below the dollar ninety line, we expected that to decrease without the crisis. With the crisis, we actually expect the opposite, which is most countries will have an increase in, in extreme poverty. Um, the third panel here on the right basically adds up and the left two panels, which is the net effect of, of COVID. Okay, a, a way to think about this uh, third panel is that in the left panel, you have those that were poor in 2019, but would have moved out of poverty in 2020. In the middle panel, you have those that were not poor in 2019, but were pushed into poverty in 2020. And the sum of those both groups would be the net effect, which is what we see on the, on the rightmost panel. And unsurprisingly, um, Sub-Saharan Africa has some of the larger, larger increases there. In terms of inequality here, what we are showing you is, is again, those countries grouped by the, by the region and the change in Gini index. Uh, for those countries, uh, the Gini is, is changes represented in percent. So these changes are, are fairly small changes, first of all. And also the changes are mixed. Some are increased, some are decreased. There are a few countries in, in Sub-Saharan Africa that had a large increase, uh, whereas there are others that, that have a, a, a decrease. Right? And we'll come back to, to, to this theme in a little bit as well. OK, so for the next uh, chart, what we're doing here is we're taking the, the group of countries with the phone service in red, those countries, seven countries with actual data in blue. And then in green, we have those countries from uh, literature survey. Um, and what we're doing is we're in, in the horizontal scale, we're lining them up according to their average daily income. So the poorest on the left, richest on the right. And on the vertical scale, we have the change in poverty, extreme poverty. Uh, so we're trying to see which countries had a, a, a big change or, or small change, right? Unsurprisingly, uh, the lower part of this, of this distribution has uh, more of a change. That's because more of the population within these countries are closer to the dollar ninety line, and any negative shock would push them below the the negative, uh, sorry, below the the dollar ninety line. That's the case for a lot of these countries, especially for 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 India, and that's what you see in this in this graph. Uh, in terms of inequality changes, again, we're doing the same thing, but now looking at the changes in 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 Gini index, and what we see is that most of these countries are scattered around this zero threshold, meaning that, that the changes were very minimal. Uh, it could be slightly positive, slightly negative, but very small changes. Um, but the thing to, to also note here is that if you move towards the richer end of the distribution, we see that a lot of the richer countries in 2020 had a decline in, in inequality, perhaps uh, you know, some of the social protection measures um, that were in place. And, and the opposite is, is true for some of the poorer countries. So moving on to global, global poverty first, and then we'll talk about global inequality. First of all, I want to show you um, the, the change in, in the number of poor in 2020 compared to 2019, which is the blue bar. We have 123 million people who were pushed into poverty who were not poor in 2019. The gray bar, is the counterfactual, which is which are those people whom we expected would have moved out of poverty had COVID not happened. Okay, and together the 143 million is what we find as the 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 added poor due to COVID. How does it compare to to poverty across the last 30 years? Well, 
besides the, the period during the Asian financial crisis where there was an increase in, in poverty, there was no other, there has been no other time with uh, an increase in extreme poverty except for, for the COVID-2020, uh, right? Um, one thing to note is that both the number of poor uh, in 2020 is a lot higher than and the number of poor that, that, were, that were pushing the poverty in, in during the Asian financial crisis. And also you have to remember that the stock of extreme poor were very large during 20 years back compared to what we have now. Okay? So percentage wise also, it, it's a really big change for 2020. Um, secondly, what we want to do is we want to take that 143 million, the added poor, and sort of try and figure out where that is coming from, what's affecting it more. Is it the negative growth shocks that, that happened uh, for those countries, or is it the within country inequality changes? And we find that within country inequality changes actually decrease uh, um, uh, the shock or, or mitigated some of the shock. Um, another way of thinking about this is um, instead of applying, so for instance, what we did was we took different households within the country and gave them different growth rates depending on, depending on how they grew, right? Um, instead of doing that, what we could have done is we could have said, okay, we're going to take the average growth rate of all households and then give everyone the average growth rate. If we had done that, that would be a distribution neutral um, uh, growth rate within country, we'd have gotten to somewhere close to 230 million um, added for instead of 143 million. Um, that does not change by much if you consider those, um, those three methods that, that we prefer. Uh, with the, the sources that we prefer. Obviously, a lot of that, uh, of the increase in poverty is, is due to India because a lot of their uh, population is just above the dollar ninety threshold and, and the negative shock would push, push a lot of them below it. Um, in this map, what we are trying to, to show you is, is how you know, it, extreme poverty has, has been affected throughout, throughout the globe. And uh, in blue, what we have are those countries that had either no change or, or, or a decline in extreme poverty, really no change uh, for most of these countries. Um, and then in red, we have those countries that had an increase in extreme poverty, the, the, the darker the color, the, the, the greater the, the increases, right? And you see that, uh, you know, this shouldn't be very surprising, you can draw a, a horizontal line across the map and you see where the global south is, and, and, and the effect is across the whole global south. Uh, one thing we thought about, thought about while, while doing this map was that um, this is obviously not fair to, to, to other countries. A lot of their population do not um, live near the, close to the uh, large portions of their population do not live close to, to the dollar ninety line. So what we wanted to also do was uh, calculate a, a absolute poverty line that was more relevant to, to the country's income level, right? So we took a country and, and took the median income or half of the median income uh, and, um, and, and subtracted a dollar from that, which is basically also called the societal poverty line. So we drew a societal poverty line for 2019 for each country, okay? And then we kept that fixed for 2020 um, and then asked how many people moved across that line be it above or below that, below that line, right? And if we do that exercise, we find that a lot many countries, the, the effect of, of, of COVID, what we can see in, in a lot many countries, right? And that, that probably um, um, is closer to what, 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 um, what has happened, which is a lot of countries have had significant effects on the bottom end of, of, of their distributions. Nishant, you um, have five minutes left. Sure, thank you. Um, so, you know, I've kept the bin same as, as before, and you'll see not only that more countries are in red here, but then more countries are in darker, deeper red, showing you the, the, the size of those impacts. Okay, let's, for the last five minutes, let's just talk about global inequality. And let's start with this uh, chart that is the growth incidence curve for, uh, for, um, for, the, for the world, which is, we're again lining up people from, from the poorest to the richest and trying to see how much welfare shock they had in 2020. But there are three things to note. First of all, everyone had a negative growth shock on average, right? Everyone's below that zero threshold. 
Secondly, there's a large shock for, for, for people living between the 10th uh, and around the 40th percentile. Okay, that also corresponds to those living between $1.90 a day and $1.50 a day. Okay, and that, that sort of uh, is consistent with some of the findings that it was the urban poor who, who were affected the most by, by the crisis. Um, and thirdly, you will notice that most of the distribution is upward sloping, meaning that inequality has increased. Right? And how much has that inequality increased? Well, if you map out the Gini for the last 30 years, you will not find any other, on a, other year where there was a marked market uptick in, in, in Gini. This is the first time we'll have that. Uh, we estimate that that increase due to COVID is, is one Gini point. What we want to do next is that break up that, that increase um, into how much of that is due to the between country portion of, of, uh, of inequality and how much of that is within uh, due to uh, with the within country inequality. And we find that just like before, within country inequality actually does not affect um, the global estimates as much. It is really the, the divergence between countries that, that, that is pushing this uh, global inequality a lot. And for that, we're using the mean log deviation because it's easier to, to disaggregate. You can, you know, look at various samples, the various samples of the of the of the global population, and and you get somewhat consistent results. Obviously, the the magnitude magnitudes change a bit. Okay, um, one final chart that we want to discuss is this chart that looks at the the change in between country inequality over the last the last thirty years. What we have done is we have taken every five year interval interval starting with nineteen eighty nine going all the way up to 2013. And then we jump from 2013 to 2017, because that's the last year of, with official global estimates. Um, and then from 2017 to 2020. Okay? And what we find is that um, in each of these intervals, really the, the distance between countries has been decreasing. And the greatest decline had been between, had been between 20, 2008 and 2013. So what this bar is telling us is that in 2013, countries were 16% closer to each other in terms of income compared to 2008. And that was obviously a bit part due to the richer countries having a, a little bit negative shock and then, and then the poorer and middle parts of the distribution catching up as well, right? For the first time, what we will see is in 2020, uh, the distances between countries will, will increase in, uh, in, in about 30 years time. Uh, we estimate that increase to be 7.6% uh, compared to 20, uh, 2017. Okay, to, to sort of wrap up um, uh, what we discussed, uh, we, we find that uh, the, the, the pandemic has caused both increases in, 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 global, in um, extreme poverty and in inequality. We find 143 million uh, people were, were pushed into poverty due to COVID-19. We also find that the increase uh, in, uh, we find Gini increased by 1.3% in 2020 compared to 2019. Just to give you an idea of what that change implies, for the last 30 years, if you, if you calculate the changes annually, the average change was negative 0.4% in Gini. Um, and if we continue at that trend uh, that we have had for the last, last 30 years, uh, another way of to, to think about this is it'll take us about four years to wipe out the increase in, in Gini that what we had in 2020. Most of the increases in, 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 the, in the global Gini was due to the increased distance between countries. And we calculate that to be a 7.6% increase in 2020 compared to 2017. The countries, uh, the inequality within countries were mixed, where, but we do find that richer countries had a tendency of dec decreasing within country inequality and the opposite for the poorer countries. Uh, the final side that I want to leave you with is that obviously we discussed this for 2020 and, and you could see that the, you know, the, the data issues are, 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 are difficult for 2020. We still do not have anything to say uh, in terms of within country inequality for, for 2021 yet. Uh, but then uh, our picture sadly does not look, look um, it looks more gloomy for 2021. Uh, we expect, you know, um, 
there to be increased distance between countries, both in terms of policies and, and how the pandemic has affected um, the inequality in vaccine access and so on and so forth. Also, we expect um, between country inequalities to increase because of um, be it unequal recovery in jobs or, or you know, some parts of the income distribution having more flexible uh, job options than other parts of the distribution or be it pullback of the, of the social security measures that were in place in, in especially in high income countries. And, and for me personally, the, the, the loss in, in schooling for, for children is a big, uh, big concern, not only for low income households, the, 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 the difference between low income and high income households within the country, but also across countries. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, thanks you so much for uh, your presentation. I have the impression that we would have uh, needed like a couple of hours to, to get uh, uh, a full uh, presentation of this, uh, this paper. Uh, it's re really dense and interesting. Uh, I will uh, now open the floor to questions from the audience. So please use the raise hand function if you want to post questions or you can paste question to your chat. Please, in both cases, you may um, want to uh, state your uh, name and affiliation. So, Chico, go ahead, thanks. Sorry, I, I was trying to see Chico Ferreira from LSE. I was um, hoping to see if somebody else would go first, but, uh, but let, me, let me go first anyway. So thanks, Nishant and uh, Christoph and Daniel. Really, really interesting. A um, couple of questions. Uh, first on between countries, then on within countries. So on, on between countries, which seem to drive the increase in inequality in your, uh, in global inequality in your analysis, how different are, so what vintage of forecasts or growth data is this relative to Deaton? Because, you know, Deaton had also an, an, an increase in between country inequality, which he claimed was basically entirely due to India, right? And if you took India out, um, it wasn't there anymore. In fact, um, uh, I think I think if I recall correctly, that's uh, now that's of course the world does contain India, and so I'm not saying that there's anything wrong. I just wanted to understand whether the difference between your results and Deaton's are um, are due to very substantial differences in the growth rates that he used relative to what you used because you're coming after him or whether it's still the case that it primarily uh, the effect of India. And on the within country, which I think is even more interesting, I think what may have shocked some people who haven't been paying attention recently is that where we actually have data, inequality has decreased within countries, um, which of course, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I've been following and finding some of that evidence from the US and from a number of European countries and even from Brazil and so on and so forth. And this is because those of us who, pre including me, who previously said this is all gonna be inequality increasing, um, we underestimated the extent to which governments redistributed massively. Um, and uh, now it's quite possible that they haven't redistributed as massively in poorer countries, but nonetheless, you know, how likely are you to still be overestimating the increase in inequality within countries where you didn't take into account that redistribution? Now, I understand that from the phone service, you've got people who say their incomes have gone up. Um, but those, uh, you know, so, so those presumably are because of redistribution. Now you had to make some big assumptions. You assumed they were growing at the same rate as in the forecast. Whereas if we look at the growth incidence curve for the US and Australia and Canada, they, the poorer were actually growing above uh, what, what would have been forecast for them. So may we still be underestimating the, the, the increases in, the decreases in inequality in those, in those poor countries. Uh, and is there anything that could be done using the amazing data set that your colleague Ugo Gentilini has about, about, uh, uh, about social protection to, to inform that question? Um, now, maybe it's just better to wait for the real data to come out, but some of it will take a long time. 
So, so those are my, my two first questions on, on between country inequality and on within country inequality. Thanks. So I'll, I'll take another question and I'll leave you then the chance to answer. Uh, Matti, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Matti Kahonen. I'm the director at Financial Transparency Coalition and we published a report on COVID-19 social uh, protection measures and how they were mitigating some of the rises in extreme poverty. And I think my question follows somewhat the previous speaker because we saw that Global South countries spent approximately three to 4% of GDP in recovery measures. But our greatest problem was that when we disaggregated the recovery measures, only 22% of that in our People's Recovery Report, and that's corroborated by also IMF's analysis of the recovery spending was to social protection. Most of it went to COVID loans to corporates or to tax cuts to wealthy corporates by having you know, corporate income tax cuts or other tax cuts to have a questionable redistributional impact. Um, so maybe trying to compare the shock versus the reaction is, is the policy debate that we're trying to have towards the IMF, the World Bank and others who are now trying to figure out what's the next phase of recovery spending with the channeling of special drawing rights into the resilience and uh, a sustainability trust or whether there is a round of debt relief or global tax changes. So we're trying to keep the recovery spending high, make sure that social protection is an as high proportion of recovery spending as possible because we see COVID loans to businesses a complete waste of money in terms of ending poverty and inequality and ensuring that there are a few countries like South Africa who are having a very big debate on universal basic income types of continued COVID recovery uh, policies. And for those countries, they, they, they need solutions on how to keep up the spending rather than cutting it. Um, and, and I guess um, showing the alarming rates of rising poverty in many countries will show that. I guess your data shows India has a very high rising poverty rate. Um, um, it seems to, in our sort of, uh, Kind of more qualitative work based on our partners, NGO sector partners, that also many parts of Africa have very high rising poverty rates as well. Thank you. Uh, Nishan, uh, I leave you the chance to answer, and then we have other two questions. So uh, if you can do it quickly, I think it's. Sure. Um, so thank you very much, Chico and Matty, for, for those questions. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in quickly and then, and then perhaps, like, you know, if Daniel wants to add something in there. Um, again. Um, on the between country uh, question uh, regarding Deaton's, uh, his I believe his paper came out early last last year, so he uses the fall 2020 vintage of, of growth rates. Um, and we have actually uh, used something similar and compared to his results. Um, um, and we do find that you know even removing India or 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 using sort so, let me track back uh, using the vintage of growth rate around his time so so you know the fall 2020 and then also the um, the january 2021 vintage we do find that that um, you know even removing india um, and or moving removing china um, affects uh, global inequality and this increase between countries is still there uh, even in our results today you saw that without india there's still this um, uptick in, in inequality as well um, so I can share you that 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 link where where I'll put it in on the chat in a little bit, where we compare that um, with Deaton's uh, exercise. And you're right that you're trying to ask that you know the the growth vintages also matter quite a bit. Um, the, regarding the question, I think uh, both uh, Chico and and Matty and 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 for me uh, both of you had interesting comments. Um, perhaps um, you know. Um, going in 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 um, answering each other or something like that um uh, how i see the shock is is twofold chico one is that there's this massive uh, dec decline in in welfare in 2020 and then and then recovery after that in, in 2021 right and i think the the within country inequality declined because of that shock for everybody in 2020 and then and then the social protection measures as you suggested and then in 2021, the recovery has been very uneven, and we don't even cap we, we haven't even started thinking about that um, in our exercise. So, so we will we do expect to see increasing inequality uh, as you thought, but then, but then this probably will be perhaps will be from 2021. Um, 
yeah so daniel do you have anything to add to that uh no thanks nishan let's let's let other people ask questions okay yes thank you so i i'm gonna read uh, the question by raul laosi from uh, unwider and then i will leave uh, part to show to to ask the last question so um uh, Raul asks, uh, uh, India seems to be a big contributor to both poverty and inequality. India has not had uh, uh, data from the National Statistical Survey uh, since 2011. We are using data from uh, uh, CMIE survey that is not comparable with the National Statistical Agency data. How sensitive is your result to the alternative data or assumption for data? So let me give uh, uh, for to Parto, Sean, for the last question, and then uh, you can you can yeah. answer. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's kind of, one can link it to Rahul Lahuti's uh, question. My question uh, pertains to figure six and figure twelve. Um, as quickly as I could see them or read them. Now, obviously, figure six shows that the change in extreme poverty. Um, was not only the highest in India, but way out of the map, above eight. Then in figure 12, you have uh, uh, kind of put the red uh, color for the, if the change was above four. And only a few countries had that. Uh, from what I could see, I may be wrong, they included India, China, and perhaps Malaysia. I couldn't just figure out it was too small for me to see. But um, so I was kind of thinking is, uh, could one say that to some extent, high growth rate countries also had the highest uh, rises in extreme poverty or even poverty. And uh, at the same time, your uh, following uh, table or, or diagram showed the importance of external factors vis-a-vis internal factors. So I was thinking, firstly, is my uh, conclusion that uh, to link the rise in uh, poverty to high growth rate experiences, is that at all correct? And second, if it is correct, then in terms of the internal vis-a-vis -vis external uh, influences, how do you compatibilize them? That's my question. Uh -huh. And unfortunately, I'll give you only two minutes to, <laughs> to answer <laughs> these two questions. So uh, great, both questions on India. That's, that's wonderful, just combining it together. Um, I guess that was planned. Um, on the data, yes, we are using CMI, CMI data. Um, and then uh, we are going to uh, use um, a CMI, CMI version of the data that the World Bank team has been working on. Um, they are actually um, trying to work around some of the concerns that there there are with the CMI data, and then try and try and update that, um, and 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 uh, with with those uh, certain corrections and so on and so forth. Um, once that is available, we'll we'll use that instead of, of the current one that we're using. Um, but uh, some of our internal discussions have shown that uh, some of the estimates are are not going to be that different uh, if we use that data compared to this one. Okay. Um, the other question on, on why India having such a large increase, a um, lot of the population in India uh, is very close, lives very close to the dollar 99, be it below or, or above it. Um, and we saw that a lot of these shocks were, were you know, concentrated to, to, to the urban poor and, 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 and those people and, and any negative shock, growth shock would, would push those folks below the poverty line. And that's what we, we see, you know. There's a large chunk of population in India that, that lives right above, uh, which makes it very difficult. We you know anytime there's a negative growth track, a lot, a lot of those people um, are pushed below the, that threshold. And that's what we find here. And that would be true for, for other countries that have populations in and around that uh, threshold as well. Thanks, Nishad. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I have uh, four questions I wanted to ask, but I'm going to send you an email. Uh, and so maybe other, other uh, in the audience could do. Uh, unfortunately, with the uh, with the uh, the online, we have to be we, to try to be on time. So I have to to close here the seminar. It's a bit, it has been a pleasure to share today's event. 
and thank you so much Dr. Yonzan for, for your presentation and thanks everyone for uh, attending. If you would like to know more about other uh, events at uh, III, please uh, follow the link in the chat and hope to see you uh, for the next uh, uh, LSE Inequality Seminar. Have a nice day, bye. Thank you so much.